Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. First, I'd like to start by thanking the uh, Stewardship Commission uh, who asked me to speak today uh, following the readings about uh, the oft misquoted but important verse about uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And then, of course, uh, speaking after that light and frothy gospel. Today, following the story of the rich man and Lazarus the beggar, and its keen insights that Jesus himself gives about the consequences of not giving to those in need. Remember, the, uh, the rich man was damned to hell. It is my pleasure to speak to you about stewardship and giving. I think the message has already been uh, pretty well lined up, so uh, I think rather than, than talk too much about that uh, light and frothy gospel, I'll share a few other thoughts. Uh, last year, uh, I spoke on the difference between Christian stewardship and secular philanthropy or fundraising. Simply put, Christian stewardship embodies that need that we all have. It's ingrained in us. It's pressed on us like DNA. We have this need as Christians to give back. Not because someone on a committee says so, or because the budget needs that. It's because God makes us this way. God makes us in His image a generous and loving image. And so we're born with that in us, that, that need to give, because we are a generous and loving people. So today I'd like to spend some, a few minutes talking about that issue and, and how we are called to give in celebration as an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. First, what, what do we mean when we say an act of worship? Well, we worship when we focus our attention on God. The Greek root of that word that means worship uh, is fall down before in reverence. It's what we do when we join together in corporate worship as a body of Christ. It's what we do when we kneel on our knees. It's what we do when we acknowledge that God that God is God. All of those things are worship. They're paying reverence to God Almighty. Now, if we focus on our corporate worship together, we as Episcopalians immediately think of our grand liturgy. Our liturgy. What's at the center of our liturgy? The center of the liturgy that we pray each week and during the week, hopefully, is that ultimate and supreme act of giving. That gift that Jesus gave us when He died on a cross so that we could have everlasting life. And we've heard that verse from John 3.16 all of our lives. It matters not where you went to church, where you went to Sunday school, what denomination you were a part of. You have heard that John 316 verse all your life. It's become so ingrained in our in our in our popular world that that you probably remember the guy standing or sitting in the end zone of NFL football games with a sign that said John 316. He was the guy with the rainbow wig proclaiming good news. Well, in spite of his ugly wig and and his unorthodox approach to sharing the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he said was true. Because Jesus did just that. So, what does all of that have to do with our need to give? As it is written, we are created in God's own image. And while we, as individuals, as we as a people are fallen, we still have that innate need. It's an urge. We're born with it. It grows in us. It's an urge to give in thanksgiving. 
Responding to that need is so important that Jesus himself today taught that parable about what may happen to those who disregard that call to yield to the need to give to those in need. Whether it's easy or not is not the point. God expects us to be like Him, a joyous, generous, and faithful giver. No more, no less. But wait, stewardship is a lot more than just chipping in at the office for the annual shoe fund. It's more than leaving an endowment to the museum or to your alma mater. Christian stewardship is a deeper understanding. It begins with the belief, a sincere belief, a true belief that all creation is made by and comes from God. That's not an ethereal statement. That's, a, that's an acknowledgement of fact. And Christian stewardship gives us an embodiment where we can find ourselves in that love of God so that we can respond to that love through, through our own gifts in return for the enormity of His. Christian stewardship is the realization that where our hearts are, so lies our treasure. We live as Christian stewards when we yield to that need that we have, that we fight against most of our lives, but that need that we, get, we have to give back, to be, to be in relationship with God by giving. Not just to keep us from going to hell like the rich man in the parable today, although that's not a bad reason, but it's not what God intended and it's not what Jesus intended in teaching that story. It's, this is about a unique act of giving as a Christian steward as part of worshiping, an act of worshiping the Almighty God. Now let's go back to the central part of our service for just a moment, the Episcopal worship service. Uh, Anglicans have worshipped the way that we worship here in this place and in other Episcopal churches across this country and Anglican communion across the world basically as we all have since 1549 when uh, Archbishop Thomas Cramner wrote some lovely majestic words that we now call the Book of Common Prayer. You know in the Episcopal Church we read more scripture on Sunday than any other denomination. We have a sermon. We have music. But if you look at our church, we look different than other churches. And why is that? Because we center our worship on one thing. The sermon is preached from the side. The old, in the old days, this would be the gospel side. The choir is seated in the transept. What's in the center of our worship? The altar. The altar, which is where we come to pray, which is where we come to share in the Holy Eucharist. Because the central act of our worship is the Holy Eucharist. And the Holy Eucharist is not a symbolic act. It's a real act of worship. It's an act that we all engage in. It's an act that changes our lives when we open our hearts and minds to the enormity of God's gift to each one of us. It's the ultimate gift of His Son's own death on a cross for our sin. Oh, the, the words are beautiful. Even though Cramner's words have been updated many times, including in 1979, the words are important and they're beautiful. But keep in mind that this gift that we have called the Holy Eucharist was written by Jesus Christ Himself because He presided at the Last Supper, the First Communion, the Holy Eucharist. And that itself says how monumental a proportion this gift is to us. Jesus did it. He did not delegate it. 
He did the tough things for us. He personally hung on that cross. He did not find a convenient way out. He didn't send in His proxy. He acted in worship for us. And make no mistake about it, Jesus Christ did not do this because He had an obligation. He had no bill to pay. He had not been sent a reminder by the, by the uh, Stewardship Commission that uh, He needed to catch up His pledge to all the people of the world. He did this because He is God. He is powerful. And He is, He was, He is, and will always be God. And He gave us he gave us, in giving His life, a supreme gift to give us a better world and a life eternal. In that vein, we are called to this altar by the words of the great thanksgiving that we will pray today to celebrate the promise of eternal life and all that has been given to us, small things, big things, everything. Now, without sounding too Presbyterian, just as Christ was preordained to give of Himself to us, we too likewise are called to give in return from the time we're born to the time we die. Because we are born and live as creatures of God. We do it by sharing what we have for the work of the greater kingdom of God in this place and beyond. Sounds easy, so how do we do it? Well, Jesus Christ gave us a challenge, as He was wont to do. He called on people to give everything up and follow Him. You know, there are still people called to do that in today's world. I stand before you today as one who is not called to do that. I have never had that calling to, to give up all that I have, so I've struggled with how to live within this role of gift giver back to God, just like everyone else does. How do we reconcile what we need to give? When we love our families, we, we want to associate with our friends, and oh yes, we have to pay the mortgage and make the car payment. We have to make sure Dominion is paid so we can hook up the Christmas lights this year and occasionally we can save enough money to spend a week at Nag's Head. With all of that in front of us, what do we do? Well, let's start at the beginning. Little babies learn to walk before they run. They take the first step. That's how they walk. They don't run before they walk. They take that first step. And being a Christian steward means taking a step in faith, that first step, and then taking more steps along your journey. Today I'd like to share just a few steps to consider. First step along the pathway, take time to ponder where all that you have comes from. Now, here's a hint. The answer is from God. Okay, we got that part. That's in the, that's in the Scripture. That's... That's in our teachings, we understand that part. And 1 Corinthians makes it real clear in 4 7 when, when the writer says, What do you have that you did not receive? You didn't make it. We've all been successful at things, but we did it with, a, with God's hand on our shoulder, with his thoughts in our mind, and his abilities in our hands. So the question is do you really believe that everything you have comes from God? If so, you've, you're on that way to that first step. You've got an advantage as you ponder your next step. But if you're not sure, well, you're not alone. The church is full of people. The church with a capital C is full of people who are still pondering that. And I would suggest that with, you, with an open heart and an open mind, God will help you with that answer. When considering how to give as an act of worship, I would suggest asking yourself, what's meaningful to me? Remember, where your heart is, so lies your treasure. And when you think about what's important to you, you'll define that treasure. 
And remember, it says give of your treasure. And, and that would mean share the loaf, not just the crumbs. Next, I would suggest that you not be goaded into giving by some program or some pithy slogan or, or someone or something or anything. Goading someone into giving is not Christian stewardship. All it does is make the budget bigger. Rest assured, it does not make your heart bigger. And really, in relationship with God, it's about enlarging the heart. Now, it also doesn't mean that you ignore the call, the practical call, the pragmatic call that we have to give because just because someone paid too much attention to statistics or budgets or programs or pithy slogans, that's not an excuse. You see, Christians worship together. We're called to worship here. We're called to worship here to be in, com in, in communion with one another, in relationship with Christians alike. We are the body of Christ, and it is our job to perpetuate that relationship here by nurturing this place. So, we are too called to worship here and be here for one another. And that means giving here. Another step along the way is answering the most difficult question of how much do I give? I can't tell you what you should give. I don't know. It's not for me to say. It's none of my business. All of those things is between you and God, and I really believe that. But I do know this, the church, again with the capital C, in its 2,000 years of imperfection, has found numerous ways to interfere with your relationship, your, interfere in your relationship with God when they resort to fundraising programs. And they talk about giving your fair share. And they talk about pie charts and statistics and thermometers that gauge success. Christian stewardship is not about Frederick W. Taylor. It's not about, it's not about exact science. It's about, and it's, it's about your own relationship. While those effect, those, while they may be effective tricks of the fundraising trade, they are not emblematic of the enormous gift of life that Jesus Christ so freely gave to each of us when He died on the cross. That's stewardship. Those other things are. Since you asked, there are a couple of suggestions that, that we should consider when we are thinking about how to respond to that need that we have and that, that all Christendom needs. First, remember, <clears throat> it's a personal decision. It's, it's you and your family. <clears throat> excuse me, it's you and... It's you and your family. And it's about you and God. Take time. Pray. Discern. Decide. Respond. And worship. And next, you heard me last year say the same thing, and I'm going to say it again. It doesn't matter how the money is used. I know that's a, that's a counterintuitive statement, but you're giving a gift. You're giving a gift just like God gave His Son and Jesus gave His life and, and they have high expectations for us, but we are here to live our lives. It just doesn't matter what happens with the money. When you give it away, you're free. You have to have, we have to have the faith that God can use our gift and more importantly, all of us because it doesn't matter what some governing board does with the money. Nothing a vestry can do can enhance or inhibit your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people find it important to talk about the tithe. <clears throat> and it is the biblical standard. It's 10% of what you have. It's hard to get there. All of us have a hard time getting there. 
But if we strive to tithe, we will move in a closer relationship with God. Because we become freer and He, and he is standing there waiting for us and with open arms as we unclench our fists. I do think it's interesting that the disciples were told to give it all away and follow Christ. The Bible tells us to give 10%, but the Chamber of Commerce expects us to, to give 20% to the waiter who served us dinner tonight, this afternoon. What does that say? That says that I'm not here to give an answer. It's for you to find the answer. That's what this is all about. This introspection, this, this, in, this inward-looking examination of Christian stewardship. You know, it's your decision. It has nothing to do with the size of the budget of this place or anyone else. It, it doesn't matter whether we want to buy new computers or hire a new staff member, fix a broken window, or even a hole in the ceiling. This is about you in relationship with God and your personal act of worship. Take it that way. Consider it that way. Take that first step. It's the most important step that you'll take. Please consider taking it today. Maybe next week. It may be next year before this all wells up in you where you feel like you need to do something different than you've done before or enhance what you've done before or share what you've done with someone else. But do it. And think about it as an act of worship. Placing your gift on that altar, as we do each Sunday, and symbolically those gifts are placed on the altar along with the gift that Jesus Christ has given us. That act of worship will affect you. It will affect this place that we know right here. And it will, it will affect the world outside these doors, outside this property line, outside of Midlothian, outside of Chesterfield, in places that you and I don't know. Because if we act and worship together, the power that we share is greater than anything we can imagine. Thank you.